basically like if you have like a different brain on when you're writing some a long longer form piece versus a short story yeah absolutely 100 percent. i do what is that what does it feel like um, feel like I think that I think the process really changes for me. Like it's interesting. I mean, you would think in some ways that the beauty of a short story, which I th I think it does work this way for some story writers, is that because it's short, you could sit down and and write it all in one go. Um, but I hardly ever write stories that way. And the kind of like the beauty of stories for me is that. I can write in these these incremental fragments, um, and so it's like a little bit in the morning, and a little bit on the subway, and a little bit in my office at school. And somehow, over the course of a couple of weeks, like all of these fragments can make a draft, and um, and it feels like slightly magical. Uh, whereas for novels, if I try and work in that super in incremental way, like I find that maddening. Like they really need for me, they need like big chunks of sustained attention. Um, and I'm very, I, I think I'm more sort of aware of like the time and the labor. Um, and there are moments that of course feel magical in the process, but I've never finished a draft of a novel. And I'm like, how did this even come together? Where I'm like, oh, I know how it came together. <laughs> right. Do you, <laughs> many, do, you many feel, mornings. <laughs> do you feel a different sense of satisfaction? when you finish short story versus novel? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think in some ways, like the novel, the, this is, there is there is a particular reward that comes with the the sustained attention with a novel and the sustained time. Like, like, I feel like by the time I get to a long form project, like I have like a deep relationship with the characters that's really different from the relationship that I have with characters and short stories. And it's not that those characters matter to me less, but I find that I don't, think about them as much once the story is finished and once the story is kind of out in the world where I feel like, um, I don't know, I think for my novels, it's like I acquire like an extra like organ or something where that world and those characters are like always with me, even as I go on to do other things, just because I've spent so much time there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. A, I yeah. feel like my gratification when I write essays is different than when I write novels. It's not, obviously an essay is not the same as a short story, but I might spend like the same amount of time on an essay as I would as a short story. Like I could spend a couple weeks writing an essay. Um, um, but it's not, I don't have to be inventive in an essay. Not in the same way yeah. as with a short You don't write, and you said you don't really write essays. I remember we've had that conversation about writing yeah. essays. You've written a couple of essays that I, I do. I do sometimes, but that's, I mean, I think you're like, when I read your essays, I'm like, there's such a, you know, you can write in a way that's really um, profound and has a lot of complexity yeah. and depth, but also you are able to create this really compact arc. And that's what like, I feel like if you, yeah, if I have to work with sort of my own experience and try and like make a shape out of it, that's where I'm just like, I am like, like a rudderless boat just going in circles in the water. Just tell me and I'll tell you. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> great. that's great plan. Um, okay, everyone, you heard it here first. The next time I have- I'm gonna family, write Laura's memoir for, her. for an essay. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just, uh, yeah, give, uh, give Jamie the idea and like a few um, salient facts and you're gonna rate it for me. I think that sounds great. Well, I can't wait to tell my publicist, like I will be so happy to write essays now. I do, I do think <laughs> that like um, all the essays that are in, um, which is something I've been thinking about since I've been writing a memoir. I know we're not really talking about this book, but let's just talk about this for a second because it's I'm, I'm thinking about it. That um, that there is such a like pattern to writing for a ma like a women's magazine or you know a certain column in in like New York Times Magazine or something like that. That there is like a structure to it that you just and because it's always only like twelve hundred words or fifteen hundred words or something like that then. Once you sort of crack what they're looking for, it's really easy to kind of, I mean, not easy, but you, you, there's a way, there's a path to get to, to the end of it. But I think if you don't see stories in that way and never are going to see stories in that way, then it won't, it won't be fun for you to write. You know, it'll feel, I just was dealing with a, helping a friend who was trying to write an essay and she was trying to write it the way she, they thought, and she was really miserable. And it just didn't, and ended up not sounding like her. So, mm, yeah. Uh, 
there's a specific voice to like you have like once I figured out what my like essay voice was then I just kind of like kept going back to it yeah. whether or not that's like real like a hundred percent real voice I don't know but I don't know if it's possible anyway because nonfiction yeah. is sort of inherently dishonest anyway yeah yeah and I think any time <laughs> like e even if I mean I feel that like even if I'm writing fiction that's very close to my lived experience. So it's sort of like, like auto fiction or essayistic fiction. I mean, it's, it's an approximation of my voice, right? Like it's not like the actual voice um, that I'm using to like talk to you. And I, I think that that's true in nonfiction also, that even if it is, it is your voice, but it's like, we have a multitude of voices inside us, I think. Um, yeah. That, so yeah, it's kind of like an approximation or a version um, or it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not like we have like, a singular voice that we are sort of always no, in that's and, and like writing, order, right? order a pizza voice, yeah, <laughs> or or whatever, or yeah, talk, talk or, to your nana voice, yeah, or talk to like Sid, yeah, or talk to my dog. No, yeah. that is a totally totally different voice. Yeah, I say things to yeah, that that's I'm not that, my my dog's name is Oscar. Yeah, the Oscar voice does not. No one else sees the Oscar. No voice. one's allowed in the mornings yeah. in particular. My dog talking to my dog voice is. Mm, it's not mortifying. It would only be, it's not mortifying to me. It would only be mortifying if someone else heard it. So. Um, um, can right. I read a little bit? Yeah, read, please. And then you're gonna read a little bit and then- I will read a little bit. Okay. I'm just gonna read the first couple pages, which is what I've been reading all along. And I, I don't, I'm so, apologize to my parents if they're on here. They've been to every single one and they've heard me read the same thing. It's very nice of them to come if they are here. Also, if they're not here, it's cool too. I don't need my parents to be here. Um, okay. Um, he was an angry man and he was an ugly man and he was tall and he was pacing. Not much space for it in the new home, just a few rooms lined up in a row underneath a series of slow moving ceiling fans, an array of antique clocks ticking on one wall. He made it from one end of the apartment to the other in no time at all his speed a failure as much as it was a success. Then it was back to the beginning, flipping on his heel, grinding himself against the floor, the earth, this world. The pacing came after the cigar and the scotch. Both had been unsatisfactory. The bottle of scotch had been sitting too close to the window for months and the afternoon sun had destroyed it. A fact he had only now just realized the flavor of the scotch so bitter he had to spit it out. And he had coughed his way through his cigar, the smoke tonight tickling his throat vindictively. All the things he loved to do, smoking, drinking, walking off his frustrations, those pleasures were gone. He'd been at the casino earlier, hanging with the young bucks, trying to keep up with them. But even then, he'd blown through that pleasure fast. A thousand bucks gone, a visit to the bathroom stall. What was the point of it? He had so little left to give him joy or the approximation of it. Release, that was always how he had thought of it. A release from the grip of life. His wife, Barbara, sat on the couch her posture, tepid shoulders loose, had slouched an acknowledgement of his existence, but she glanced at him now as he paused in front of her, and then she dropped her head back down again, her hair dyed black, chin limping slightly into her neck, but still, at 68 years old, as petite and wide-eyed as ever. Once she had been the grand prize, he had won her, he thought, like a stuffed animal at a sideshow alley. She flipped through an architectural digest. Those days are gone, sweetheart, he thought. Those objects are unavailable to you. Their lives have become a disgrace. Now would have been an excellent time to admit he had been wrong all those years to confess his missteps in full, to apologize for his actions to whom? To her, to his children, to the rest of them. This would have been the precise moment to acknowledge the crimes of his life that had put them in that exact location. His flaws hovered and rotated, kaleidoscope-like, in front of his gaze, multicolored, living, breathing shards of guilt in motion. If only he could put together the bits and pieces into a larger vision to create an understanding of his choices, how he had landed on the wrong side, perhaps always had and always would. Instead, he was angry about the bottle of scotch and suggested to his wife that if she kept a better home, none of this would have happened. And also would she please stop fucking around with the thermostat and leave the temperature just as he liked. And she flipped another page, bored with his scotch, bored with his complaints, the guy downstairs said something again. She said about this, she motioned to his legs, the pacing, they could hear it through the floor. I can walk in my own home. He said, sure, she said, maybe don't do it so late at night though. He marched into their bedroom, stomping loudly and plummeted head first onto their bed. Nobody loves me, but not that I care. He had believed briefly he could find love again, even now as an old man, but he'd been wrong. Loveless, fine, he thought. 
He closed his eyes and allowed himself one last series of thoughts, a beach, sand bleached and impenetrable white, a motionless blue sky, the sound of birds nearby, a thigh, his finger running along it, no one's thigh in particular, just whatever was available from a pool of bodies in his memory. His imaginary hand squeezed the imaginary thigh. It was meant to cause pain. He waited for his moment of arousal, but instead he began to gasp for air. His heart seized. Release me, he thought, but he couldn't move. Face down in the pillow, a muffled noise, a freshly laundered scent, a field of lavender, the liquid cool color of the flower, interrupted by bright spasms of green. Release me. Those days are over. Ooh. We've lost the one here. Yes. Okay. Now I am unmuted. Um, that was beautiful. I love the beautiful and horrible and all the all the best all the best ways. Um, I'm just going to read the opening um, section of a story in Wolf called "Your Second Wife," uh, which is about a woman who impersonates um, dead wives for bereaved husbands. And these are titled sections, but I'm only going to read the first one, so I don't think it matters. Uh, it's the first section is called Gig Economy. The photograph arrives in a padded manila envelope pressed between two sheets of cardboard. The picture is a headshot with a blue nothing background of a corporate portrait. The dead wife wears a starched white blouse and a black jacket gray irises like slivers of ice, a modest toothless smile, tasteful gold studs in her earlobes. Her name is, was, Beth Butler, and she was killed in a hiking accident five weeks ago. As a grief freelancer, this is not the first time I have received such a photo, nor is it the first time the photo has been mailed with such care. The husbands, I have yet to be hired by a wife, contact me at a designated email. I send them an online questionnaire and request a photograph be mailed to a PO box because I like to be able to hold the wives in my hands. And as my sister has pointed out many times before, I can't be giving the, these grieving husbands my home address. Next, I require three videos of the wives in their natural environments, delivering a work presentation or jogging along a river or carrying a birthday cake into a crowded singing room. Then I need a week to prepare and then we meet. Between impersonating dead wives, I work as a part-time dog walker and a part-time landscaper and a part-time food delivery courier. What an unbelievably exhausting moment to be alive in this era of the gig economy. All right. Um, I have a question for you, if I may. Um, so we are formally here. I know we, we, there a bunch of, there's a bunch of stuff we want to talk about tonight, but formally we are here to celebrate the paperback uh, release of um, All This Could Be Yours. And I was thinking, thinking about things that we might talk about, like pa the paperback, it, it sort of marks a period of time, right? In the book's life in, in, it's like the book's like first birthday, you know, it's been, it's been around for approximately a year. And I was wondering, um, as you're doing events for the novel now, do you feel like your, your perspective on, on the work changes or do you think about it and talk about it? in a different way? Or do you feel like you're in a way that your imagination has kind of flown off to be with the next project? I mean, I, I don't, I wasn't done, right? Like, because this is a weird year, um, I had all these tour dates and I feel like I don't really, I, I'm on a cycle always of having like a year, like to, promote a book, right? Because mm -hmm. I do initial round and then I do stuff like abroad. Like I had the tour, I was supposed to be in Germany and England and Ireland. Um, and the converse, I find that like the conversations that I have with people out on the road and as well as like how it's reviewed, how I'm written about, um, all of that feeds into how I end up, how, how I end up feeling about the book later and then I even feel like it I need a little bit more time after that to like sort of return to it um 
I think it the I think when a book initially comes out and maybe it's a little bit different than a short story collection because this is so specifically about this family and there's a focus on like what the book is actually mm -hmm. about and trying to you know and it's sold in a specific kind of way too so i think the conversation at the beginning is really about what i'm trying to like say in the book yeah. and then now that i'm like it's a year later i can look back at it and i think it's like less about what i was trying to say and like i like i loved all the cool shit i did in the book mm -hmm. you know what i mean like to me i always am trying to do some like move forward and be try new things and to me, I loved the structure and I loved that there were some really, there was some inventiveness with the characters. And like, when I look back at this book, it's less to do with what it was about because I think I spent more time with the aboutness of it. And now I'm looking back at like how, what I, lessons I can take from it to move on to the next thing. And it's not about the plot of the book. It's about like the crafty stuff and the technical stuff that I, cause I'm always like, I, yeah, I'm always with a new book. I'm trying to put myself through my paces and learn how to do something new. So that's how I feel a year later is like, man, I did, I did do what I, you know, I did do some cool stuff that I, that I really liked doing. Um, but it's hard to know. I don't know. I don't, I don't feel done with it. So like, I don't feel done with like the business of it. So, and, and maybe never will, but that's all right. Cause I, at least I had that first round, you know? Did I just say a lot? Oh no, you're, you're muted. You're muted, Laura. Oh boy, can I unmute you? Yeah, oh. There you go. Yes, there we go. Yeah, I got, I was, I was trying to unmute myself. No, you were being brilliant and amazing. I was trying to unmute myself, but I was getting a message saying that the, um, I, that I, in fact, was forbidden to unmute, oh. my, to unmute <laughs> myself. Um, yeah, I do think, I mean, stories are, yeah, I mean, I do think with stories, it's a little bit different. I mean, one thing about stories, it's like, you know, usually you're publishing them in magazines, um, uh, like, along the way. So it's like, there is a sense of, of kind of, maybe having conversations with readers about like like the individual stories as they come out. Um, where I think with novels, it's like those interactions with sort of readers or reading, you know, what people think about the book, whether it's critic or profile or whatever, how they're sort of understanding that aboutness that you were speaking to. It's just like so few people have read it, you know, it's That's like right. you have your, your readers that have read it and you have your agent and your publishing team, but it's like. But, and people haven't talked about it with each other yet right. and, and, yeah. uh, and so you're out there on the first round you're selling it you're the salesperson right and then by the time you get to the end people are like but how did you do that or they have they want you know it's set when the dust has settled like what's left behind is like kind of this hopefully the piece of art that you made yeah as yeah. opposed to the conversation about it yeah um how do you, because I feel like this is a really difficult thing for a lot of writers. I mean, how do you sort of move from this space of being like, it is, yeah, it's my job to be out talking about the book, representing the book, selling the book into a space where you feel like you can make art again and be creative in that way and sort of depart fully into the next. Like, can you just maybe describe what that transition or what that sort of journey looks like for you? So for me, like, I'm not happy unless I'm working on something. So when, so the moments when I'm not working, I'm like, I feel like des like a little desperate. I mean, I give myself a break, especially if I'm on tour. If I'm on tour, I'm not writing, but I need to know what I'm going to be working on next at least, or have an idea of what I'm working on when I go on the road. And I'll write a little bit on the road just to sort of keep myself sane. So it's, um, it's really necessary <coughs> to have something to work on. Um, so in this instance, like I, again, a, a weird year. So I ended up like just having nothing better to do than, but to like work on the book. I taught some this summer, but um, I just kind of dove in and like, was like just really trying to like keep in it. And, and it's, and it's much safer place to be than the real world. Especially yeah. Oh also. yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, um, so I don't know, like, but I, but I will say that I have certainly given advice and had conversations with many authors who, especially debut authors who 
go out on tour and they put out their first book and then it's like they can't write again for like three months because their head can't stop spinning. And now I feel like I know that that's what's going to happen and I'm not going to like beat myself up about it. And, um, and, and then I'll just, and then one day I'll just be ready to go again. Right. But it's, a, yeah. it's not happiness to not be working. That's for sure. Oh yeah. No, I can I think we're very similar in that way. Right. Where we both like to be in projects and working and, um, yeah. And, and in, right. In, in the pages. Yeah. I, th I feel like, I mean, it seems like an important transition also is like, you know, being in a, in a, getting back to a space where you're sort of like not, um, you know, I think when you have a book coming out, you're sort of hyper aware of like how people are responding to it. Right. And being able to kind of move back into a headspace where that's like not your first area of like concern, you know, I mean, I think for me, at least if I was writing, um, and the response of other people was it sort of the foremost of my, like foremost thing in my mind, like I probably would not write again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It doesn't really, I mean, it matters and it doesn't. There's like a separation between like the business side of it where it's like you want people to talk about it and you want people to keep talking about it, but also like you don't want to have to hear it. <laughs> yeah. After yeah, a yeah. certain point. So, you know um, into the, into I've definitely the been thinking about, I mean, I mean, I wonder, so you just had this book come out in the midst of all this. Obviously it's a different experience than when you've had, although you did tell me yesterday that you have like four events a week until December or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, I have not quite that much. I, I had that much earlier in the summer. I mean, now it's, 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 I'm like one or two a week. Yeah. Probably yeah. maybe like, like six a month or something, something like that. So yeah, I mean, not like a bonkers amount, but pretty steady. But it still feels um, different than a regular it launch. It does. Yeah, it does. I mean, there is definitely a lot that I miss about doing IRL events. I mean, I think just um, there, there are a lot of kind of, um, you know, ambient conversations that you end up having with people, right? Whether they be readers or friends that, you know, you don't get to see as much as you would like that you get to have like dinner with after the event. I mean, all of that sort of ambient human contact I miss. I also really miss the physicality of like being in bookstores, you know, and like yeah. being hosted by, McDally Jackson and um, it's like such a beautiful you know like what a lovely store to be in and I love like I can visualize like the shelves and the way the books are organized and sort of where I would start browsing and I, I, I miss that phys physical experience a lot but I will say I mean I think you know there are many virtues to events that happen virtually I mean accessibility is one virtue virtue, right? Like you don't have to be in New yeah. York, right? To come see us tonight, which is fantastic. Um, and we're so glad that you all are here wherever you are tuning in from. Um, and, and I think um, also like just in terms of my own work and, and also, you know, it's, it's someone who's, who's trying to make headway on new projects. I mean, it does take, you know, a, a, it, it does, it's, there's not the sort of physical intensity. Like, I think it takes me a while to recover just from the travel. You know what I mean? If you're on the road pretty steadily for a month or six weeks, um, just recovering from, from, you know, and all this, the, the life things that sort of stock up when you're, you're, you're not really in a place where you can deal with them. Um, I mean, there's, there's that, that sort of recovery period, which I, I find that I'm really not needing because, um, you know, I'm, I'm like doing events from home. Um, so yeah, I, how have you found, cause you've been, you've been doing events for the, well, I mean, you've been doing events in other capacities, but also for the paperback, like how have you found the virtual events and like, what do you, what do you think is like generative about them? And like, what do you, do you like miss doing the IRL stuff? I mean, I miss seeing my friends. Like that was always the best part or like seeing people like when I did like the last tour I went, like all these people who had done a thousand words a summer came to like almost every single event. And that was like the greatest thing in the world because it made it feel like it was like a real thing. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm turning in my like manuscript for my book three months ahead of schedule. So, <laughs> which is crazy. And I remember at the beginning, like my editor was like, Hey, you know, 
if you're gonna you if you need a little leeway if things are gonna go, run late like it could go a couple months later than that like we have a little bit of room whatever like if you're traveling too much and now I'm like just like zooming through it so no pun intended um, so I don't know I've liked I've liked teaching I've I've done I did a, you know some conferences this summer and I I, I enjoyed doing it through that um, although I would have enjoyed getting out of the New Orleans heat more. And going to the Hamptons or something yeah. like that. Like yeah. to teach, I've taught. I was supposed to be teaching in the Hamptons this summer. I was like, I would have been on the ocean every day. Um, I don't know. I'm just rolling with it. I don't. I don't. I. I just don't see much point in like feeling angry or annoyed or bad when I have a roof over my head. And yeah, it's it's not the certainly not the most not the end of, Yeah. And I also have so many friends that are teachers that are really have it's really hard for them like they're doing half in person and half at home mm -hmm. or like they're t teachers uh you know with kids who like are there they feel that they're losing them because it's just too it's just too hard and then there's parents who are teaching at yeah. home and all that kind of stuff so for me i'm just like whatever like yeah. a couple of days a week you know a month i had to like teach a writing workshop and it's exhausting, but what, I don't know. I mean, I just feel very, I honestly feel quite fortunate. It's, it ended up being okay. I don't, you know, for me, I feel very much more sympathetic for people who have, like yourself, although I think it's gone okay for you. Yeah. Who've had books come out, especially my friends who had books come out in like March, April, May. Yeah. I think that it was harder. Happening. It was I think not that happening. was harder. I mean, my book came out at the end of July, so there's just a lot more time to kind of like think through what we wanted events to look like. And I, I think one thing that we kind of came to, it's like, let's try and do a couple of events um, that we couldn't do in person, right? Like let's sort of use what is unique about the medium to like put together events that just like would be logistically impossible in person. And so, yeah, for my launch, that was um, cool. You're lucky. Yeah, we like a sh kind of short story panel with um, a, an amazing group of writers, and just like logistically, like there's no way that we could have ever gotten our schedules to like coincide to do an IRL event. I mean, we're on all different parts of the country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think that that was also exciting to think like, how can we actually be really creative in, in this space? Um, and, and sort of what can we, what are the sort of advantages of the, yeah, of doing events virtually that we can, you know, use as much as possible. Yeah. Um, so before we go to questions from the audience, and I think there are already a few in the chat, which is awesome. Um, you, um, you mentioned a thousand words of summer earlier, and I want to ask you about two things. I know we were. Oh yeah. We're still to talk about. Yeah. Summer. They're yeah. connected. Yeah. So you started this um, online newsletter called Craft Talk, um, which is uh, which is so I love getting the newsletters in my inbox. Like I, it's like I feel like one of the few emails that I open and I read like right away um, with joy Honor. instead of yeah instead of like procrastinating on on opening it. Um, and and uh, true to the title, it, it's a newsletter that sort of talks about the, um, you know, the craft of writing and you give like prescriptions and ideas. Um, and it's, I've sh shared a lot of them with my students and they're really wonderful and, and sort of a connected thing. Your, um, your entry uh, today was on um, first readers that like how to be a good first reader for the writer friends in your life. Um, and I know that was something that we wanted to, to talk about. Um, but I was just wondering before we talk about the, the second thing, um, could you tell us a little bit about like what like inspired you to, to start this? I mean, it's so, it's super generous. So I uh, no one's okay. I haven't really said this out loud because no one's, I haven't really talked about it yet because I just kind of started this like a month ago. I was just trying to think about what I could do to help people, to writers. I did a lot of um, conferences this summer and I'll just, you know, like I'll be really forthright about it. It was, a, it was like a lot of white women in my classes and um, who could afford to take classes with me. And it was really, um, they were all very nice and I was happy to teach them, but I just felt like, uh, I always feel like there's just barriers to these kinds of things and barriers to, um, to information. And mm -hmm. so, um, I, you know, I'd started a thousand words a summer 
in the same way of thinking. And I don't know, I was just trying to figure out the best use of my time, that I could put information out there and that all kinds of people could have access to information about writing and they wouldn't think, oh, I need to get an MFA or, oh, I need to take this writing workshop. And I'm not saying that what I'm doing is a substitute for any of those things at all, but I just know who, who is specifically in these classes for the most part right. and, and who can afford that like next level of time with me. So I think that that was part of the starting point for me is like, how can I reach the most amount of people and, and start conversations? Like, I'm, again, it's like, I, here's what I think, but like, use it and talk about it with, you know, think about it for yourself or talk about it with somebody else or don't use it at all. But I really just wanted um, to, to put that stuff out there and to like have also have people realize that like you, like you don't have to you can think these ideas are available to you and accessible to you. And they're not just for whoever can like afford that situation. So yeah. um, I think that was, that was really kind of the starting, the starting point for it. Yeah. And um, uh, I'm going to do it for a year. It's a year project. I don't know how much I'm going to have to say at the end of a year, but um, I thought I could just try it and see if yeah. it, and see what it, see what it's like. Um, and what are, what you, so you're, I know you just like wrote about it, so not to make you repeat yourself, but, um, I know we have, I know we have write, writers in the, in the, in our, our virtual audience. What are your, yeah. What are your thoughts on sort of like what makes a good first reader? Um, well, I just, I think the biggest point of the thing that I wrote today, um, is that it's people have to, you have to sort of look at something and not think about it the way that you would write it or the way you would necessarily fix it. But the way that you have to sort of help the writer to write in their own way and in their mm -hmm. own voice. And it's actually, you know, it's, not, it's hard in a way to think about that. But in theory, if the writer is asking you, it's because they trust you and you're probably familiar with their work in some way. Um, and it may, it, it, I think maybe it can be a challenge for the reader, but also you're, if you do it right, you learn from the experience too. Hmm. It's not yeah, just about, you know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a conversation. So, um, and we had, you know, I wrote in a letter about how you would get what you had said to me. And I don't even know if I was helpful to you when I like, yeah. you were so but, helpful, but yeah. we were just very like specific in our, in what we were talking about and what we, what we needed from, from each other. And so that's like about being, um, you know, good communicators. All these things are, um, I think, are helpful as writers and as artists and as also as human beings mm -hmm. too. Yeah, right. In some ways, it's like any relationship, you know what I mean? Where it's like, tell me what you need and I will listen and then respect, you know. Yeah. Right, like what you, what you tell me. What do you think makes a good first reader? Well, I think what you said, and I also think what you, for anyone, um, who's in the audience who like is, is part of a, a workshop community. I mean, I, I think, um, I think like to be a good sort of early reader for someone's work is, um, I think I completely agree with everything that you said. And I mean, I think to try and kind of like inhabit the in ambitions of a project, right. And like the writer's ambitions and sort of what they want it to be and to kind of, um, figure out if you can sort of train your mind like as best you can to sort of think in those directions. But I'm, yeah, always saying in, um, in my classes, like that's sort of what we need to do in workshop also, right? Because it's really useless if you bring a piece to workshop and, because that's essentially what we are in a workshop community. Like we are early, you know, readers for each other. And mm. if student A brings, you know, their story in and student B is like, well, this is how I would revise it. It's like, that's, typically like not very helpful to, to student A. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, right, being able to kind of, um, to sort of really try and think about what the writer is doing, what they want to accomplish, what they want um, the work to, to be. Um, and also, I think in the, um, with my, I'm doing a I'm experimenting with like a new kind of workshop structure this semester where students write a letter to the class and they give us like three questions that they want us to talk about and that's all we talk about in workshops so the writer actually like completely oh, that's great. agenda for it um 
and we're, you know, doing like really encouraging them to sort of think about these questions and describe why these questions are, are meaningful to them and why they want to hear our thoughts on them. Um, and I think it's like, I feel like I, I mean, it's not necessarily that structured, but um, because these are also like, really, you know, like, like I know you really well, so I can just say, Jamie, like, please read for this. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, that's like, like, I always like to ask if I'm reading a draft of something for a friend, like what, what kind of feedback are you looking for? Like, what do you, what do you need? Yeah, you're really good about right, that. Right yeah. now. Um, and I think you asked me the same thing when I gave you an early draft of I hold a wolf and I'd specifically asked you to read for sort of like order and shape. But and, I, yeah. I've had to learn to do that. So, and like, I just want to like emphasize that again, cause it's like, I write these letters and I'm like, this is what I think. This is what I know. But also like I've screwed up along the way and not known it. And like having not been in an MFA program and having not been in a workshop environment, I mean, really, truly like for 20 years, I started teaching like in, you know, 2010 or whatever. And I hadn't been in a classroom for 20 years and I had to like learn about how to teach and I right. did trial and error because I just didn't know. And then I like watched and I listened and I talked. So I've screwed up along the way and only and have arrived at this place of and continue to learn from other people. So, which is yeah. great. But you're so, yeah, you're, you're great. You're a great reader. I'm, I feel so lucky that I can, yeah, send you work. I know. I can't wait to do it. Read it. We're going to swap again. And it's going to be Soon, great. I know. <laughs> um, okay. So we're, I know we're getting close to the um, top of the hour and there's some questions in the chat. Um, so yeah, aud audience, um, thank you for uh, being with us. And I think we will take your questions now. Hi, I'm back. Um, thank you both for a really wonderful discussion. Um, I see some questions I'm going to get to in the chat, but before we start, um, Jamie, just for, for those who might not be familiar, I don't know how many people are or aren't, tell me about 1,000 days of summer and, and 1,000 1, words of summer and how 1,000 days, that's what this oh, that would felt like. <laughs> <laughs> But, but tell me about the concept of that because oh, yeah. I think it's it changed how I look at writing. I, I, it started three years ago and um, it was just sort of like a, um, I was talking to a friend of mine here who's a teacher but who had written a memoir and it was summertime and she was like, I really got to get started on my next book. And we were like, I was like, let's do a boot camp where I write every day for two weeks. And, um, and then I think I posted something on Twitter like that we're going to do this and all these people at once were like, I want to do it too. And I was like, all right, I'll start. I'll just like post a little newsletter. You guys can sign up and I'll just like send out one encouraging email. And then like 2000 people signed up like right away. And so I was like, okay, I guess I have to like make this into a thing. And I just started asking friends who, who were writers to write little um, notes about creativity and productivity and things like that to put in it. And so, and it was just very organic and natural. And then like the next year was 5,000 people. And then the next year was 10,000 people. And it was, and I actually did two rounds of it this year. One words a day, every day for two weeks. Um, because um, I did two weeks rounds this year because everyone was needed. <laughs> and like we wanted to like write a little bit more. And it was just, it's just been such a strange time. But I've now said that three times, but we all know that. Um, so, uh, and it, I think the thing that's like most like um, important is like that um, it, it encourages people to like be messy and make mistakes and get dirty and just turn, just to generate. Sorry about my dog. Um, I'm gonna close the door. Um, just to sort of generate new um, new words and just get the words down on the page because I think that the main thing that I hear from students and from um, and from you know just writers in general is that they want is that they sort of agonize over things being perfect all the time and they get sort and they get I just did a prescription about getting stuck in the middle and it's like just write and get to the end and then go back and take a look at it and so that's kind of one of the big thrusts is like just to like generate the information you know just or just keep going so I think it's good. I mean, it seems helpful. It's a lot of work, um, but I want people to write and I get so much out of it. I love writing so much. So I just want to give that gift to other people. Love that. Um, so let me go back now. We have questions about all oh, this could be yours. So why don't we, we address them first? 
Um, Joseph asks, why do you think Barbara puts up with her abusive husband? It's well, a new topic, but uh, yeah. No, it's good. I mean, it's not the first time I've been asked that question. Um, and maybe I answered it differently a year ago than I would now. Um, you know, the book was really an investigation in part into um, like a, my response to like um, why, um, um, you know, this majority of white women in America voted for Donald Trump. And um, even though, you know, that's like, an, that's like a guiding idea that was in my head, but obviously um, my books don't work unless there are good characters. I'm a very character driven writer. And so if I decided like, I'm gonna make a political book and these are my politics, I just don't think it would work well for me. Um, but that was kind of a question that I had about it. Um, as I got to know her as a character, um, I think that she put up with him because he, you know, he, in his way, represented safety to her. And I think that the safety was involved with financial support. I think that safety was involved with like a kind of a conven conventional existence, even though they had like a very, in a, in a way, a very unconventional existence because they led a very private existence and he kept her isolated. Um, I think she was abused. I think that, um, I think she was complicit also at the same time. So it's not really an easy answer, but I do think that um, her idea of safety was her idea of safety. And I think that, and I really would say that, um, you know, she likes her things, right? <laughs> she likes to surround herself with her things, part of it. Um, speaking of that, can you talk about the financial aspects of writing? You wrote a great essay about the financial aspects of leaping into doing this full time. And we'd love to hear an update. Um, well, I don't really recommend it <laughs> as a career. <laughs> but um, it got really dark in here, didn't it? Um, I, don't really, I don't know. I mean, I feel OK now. Like, I've been, I've been working at this, like, for my you know, first sold my first book in 2004. So it's been 16 years of working at this career. And um, I still have, you know, things that I do on the side in terms of like teaching at these workshops and things like that. Um, and sometimes teaching in different writing programs on occasion. Um, I feel much more financially stable than I have been in the past. Um, part of that is because I don't live in New York City anymore, um, which is really helpful, has been really helpful for me. Um, as a person who lives on their own in particular, I think it's really hard because that's a lot of rent to shoulder for just one person. Um, and um, so my life has gotten a, like a little bit easier, but I will tell you that you never are, you are always afraid that it could be taken away from you. There is always, um, there's always a, you always are thinking about what your plan B is for sure. And I've had many conversations with writers who think about what the, who talk, uh, and I writ, wrote about this a little bit in the book that I'm working on now, that you always, you're always just, if you've been broke, and I've been really broke, and I've been really broke recently enough, like when I was 40, right? Couch surfing when I was 40 was not cute. Um, didn't feel cute. Cute maybe when you're 25, not cute when you're 40. Um, and I didn't, I, I, you always, I always sort of had this fear that it could, it could, to be taken away from me, this, the financial stability, especially if you're a person that's on your own, you know, not married anyway. Um, so I, I, I'm sure that part of like why I work as much as I do, at least small part is because I just want to like stay stable. And, and has your sense of the financial parts about writing changed at all in this past year during the pandemic? Your circumstances changed? This is for both of you. Say, say it one more time. That's my... Has your idea about the financials of writing changed over this past year? Like, do I think the industry is going to go to hell? <laughs> I'm not putting words in your mouth. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I there's still you know there's still people buying books out there, so they they might not be buying um, novels. I don't know, but um, they're they're whatever, whatever keeps the industry afloat, you know, there's no, there's no snobbery about, um, 
about books that are like sell like 50 million copies, right? Like, I don't feel like, like I'm happy whoever wants to keep the ship running, you know, as long as it's not like some evil right wing, whatever, like, I don't know. I hope, I, I think it's okay. No one's paying rent on these office buildings anymore, are they? I don't know. What do you think, Laura? I don't know. Yeah, I, hmm. I feel like, I, yeah, I, I think in some ways that that I, I, is it's such a massive question that it's like too overwhelming to consider right now. Um, but I think like, yeah, I mean, for, for in a weird way, um, because uh, we, my, we being my husband and dog and I had been, um, and we have university um, teaching jobs, but like had for that reason been living in uh, Boston and now are for, for various reasons in, um, in Florida where I grew up, it's like our overhead has actually come down a lot um, because, so I think I, it's like, I can see like a window maybe into the life that you're living at, Jamie, where I'm like, oh, when you don't live in a, you know, like a large coastal city and Boston is like sort of on the edge or perhaps now over the edge of like a San Francisco-esque like housing crisis in terms of the rental market there is like really, really bonkers. Are we, are we um, both millionaires now? Is that what we're saying? <laughs> We're not. Well, it's not, what I, it's not what I'm saying. <laughs> that would be that would be amazing. But yeah, it's this like weird thing where like our overhead has um, has gone down a lot, um, and 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 it's sort of like made us think, um, you know, about what a life would look like and what our lives would look like in a different place. Um, because now we're you know we're teaching remotely, of course, but presumably like we will be teaching you know, IRL again, and we'll like go back to, to where we normally are. So, um, yeah, but I, th I think about, I mean, I think about the, um, about the, 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 yeah, I feel like I'm always imagining my life in like different places. And I, I think being from, and sort of what that would mean, I mean, in, in so many different directions, I mean, like financially, emotionally, socially, artistically. Um, and I think, in some ways, I, I feel particularly in the last couple of years, like a really deep longing to go back to Florida and to live there again. And then I also feel at sometimes like an equally strong sort of like aversion, like I just can't be the person who can be there again, um, always. And um, so I think that in some ways, like this year, it is, is, has been, will be a sort of interesting experiment in what like life at home looks like. Um, and feels like and writes like after being away for a long time. Um, and that's not, I guess, Maris, that's not really a, a real direct answer to your question, but, um, but there is a financial component to that too. And that's just what made me think of it. Do you think you're writing better in Florida or differently? Well, it's hard to know. I mean, it's certainly like I have more mental space here. It's certainly quieter. I have a better workspace, but also like those um, sort of uh, open doors are like colliding with everything that like 2020 <laughs> is and continues to be um, and everything that this country like has has been well before this year so I mean I think it's been you know in some ways like a difficult year to work but um, but I I do feel like I actually have been writing um, I think it's too soon for me to assess honestly like this is just my most honest answer I mean I think it's too soon for me to assess whether I'm writing well or not um, because I'm I know that I'm writing a lot but I'm very very close to the work and so I don't have a lot of objectivity right now I I know that I know that when I wake up in the morning. And I, and I make coffee because I can't do anything without coffee. And I feed the dog. So that's also like priority number one always. Um, I know that I, the next thing I want to do is go to my desk and make work. And I think that that for me at this stage is like the most, most important thing. And it's something like in, in the reality that we're, we're in, um, like I'm just so, so grateful to have that like portal that's still open for me despite everything. I think you're writing really well. I haven't read anything, but I just know. Thank you. You just I know. Just you, just have, you just have, have a, a feeling. good gut. I have a good gut yeah, about you. You have a good gut. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I hope so. 
everything that I just said also like I, I, is like a pep talk I give to myself when I'm having moments of like devastating anxiety about whether I'm writing well or not. So yeah. It's just like it's a, a long it's a pendulum. It's, just, it's a long, life is just a long st string of pep talks. I, I mean, like, it's so funny, like thinking about the craft talks and thinking about a thousand words too. like, oh, oh, I'm just talking to myself a lot of the time, you know, like I'm just trying to get myself to keep going every single day. I feel like everything I do is like simultaneously a conversation with the world and a conversation with myself. Yeah. That, of and, all my writing. Yeah. Oh, please, please keep talking to yourself. Yeah. So we can, yeah. <laughs> so we can, we can be a part of those conversations. Or my dog, I guess. <laughs> On that note, um, Thank you both for such a wonderful evening, talking about your books and your work and everything that goes into it. It's been really fun and wonderful. Yeah, thank you thank so much. Yes. Thank you to host, yeah, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for, uh, to everyone who came. Yeah. Please order their books. Bye, see you guys.